Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. The Romance of the Far Fur Country is a documentary that was made in 1919 and released in 1920 to coincide with the 250th anniversary of the Hudson's Bay Company. Released two years before Nanook of the North, this documentary, which is two hours long, could actually hold the distinction of being the first feature-length documentary. Now, of course, some things of it were staged. It was back in the 1920s, and in the nook of the North, many things were staged. Nonetheless, it holds the distinction of being one of the first. So I talked with Kevin Nickel of the Winnipeg Film Group about restoring this documentary and releasing it for everybody to watch and enjoy. So let's go to that interview. So I'm a filmmaker... I'm an independent filmmaker based in Winnipeg, and uh, for years I've been working on documentaries and really focused on Winnipeg documentaries uh, and history of Winnipeg, um, partially because of uh, some funding that was available for for independent uh, documentaries. And I was looking at how do I move beyond um, a local story, something about my city, and then trying to think about okay if i were interested in telling more of a national story how could i approach a canadian story and a canadian history story so i I started looking at um, topics in canadian history and thinking about well what are the big foundational um chapters in canadian history and you know very quickly hudson's bay company came to mind uh, because of its you know epic um uh, importance to Canadian history. So I started researching, you know, what are some of the the films that have been done on the HBC? And I was hoping that there would be a, a gap somewhere in the, the filmography of, of um, the Hudson's Bay Company. You know, there had been some projects that had been done in the past, and I was hoping I could pick something about it, and then I could ex- explore something that people hadn't really done recently. Um, and so in, in my research, I came across a book by Peter Geller. Uh, the book is Northern Exposures. And uh, basically, he, he researches and covers photography and cinema in the Canadian North um, in the, the first half of the 1900s. And um, so he was, he was looking at um, the, the different photographers and projects that pe- uh, people like the Hudson's Bay Company crews had had made. And in his book, he had a whole chapter on this project called The Romance of the Far Fur Country. And um, so in the I'm, I'm reading in his book, in, in Peter Yeller's wonderful book, the description of the Hudson's Bay Company's desire to create this commemorative feature project on the work that they have, they're doing and, and kind of like a combination of a history and a conte- contemporary scope of the Hudson's Bay Company's projects circa 1920 because they were leading up to the 250th anniversary of the Hudson's Bay Company at that point. So my, my initiation into this and my discovery of it was reading this book and I'm, I'm reading the chapter and I'm constantly looking into the footnotes and say, thinking, okay, where is this footage? Because the description is, is amazing. And uh, that led me to you know, track down the, the author, Peter Geller, and also talk with the local archives here in Winnipeg, the Hudson's Bay Company archives based in Winnipeg, and then eventually um, flying to London to actually see the footage because it, at that point it was still kept at the, the BFI, British Film Institute, in, in London. So that's kind of like the first start to the, the, the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, at, and once we, my, my brother Chris, who's also a filmmaker, once we had seen the footage in London, then we really knew not only do we want to make a film about this, which led to a, our feature documentary, but we're also we're really, really interested in bringing the fragments of romance of the far fur country back to to viewers and also attempting to reconstruct it and so the reconstructing what did that involve right so um i guess to 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 kind of set that up in 
the, the, the film was shot in 1919 in anticipation for the big anniversary of 1920. And so when the, the Hudson's Bay Company released the film in 1920, um, and we're about a week away from the 100th anniversary, May 3rd was the premiere of the film in, in Winnipeg. The, um, the film was released and, and played in Winnipeg, and then it toured a little bit um, across the country. And um, so what happened was the film... The Hudson's Bay Company was also distributing its own film and was trying to figure out what to do with it. Once it had played um, a certain amount and had toured a certain amount, what they began to do was they began to cut up the film into shorter films. And they also made a, a UK version of the film. So there's a 90 minute version that was actually created as well. So as the, and of course, this is during the, the era when there really wasn't a sense of we want to preserve a, a copy of our film, keep it in the library. Like in those early silent year films, like the, the, the studios and the distri- distribution companies really didn't have a sense of um, needing to, to preserve copies. And so they're, they're kind of cannibalizing their, their version of the film and making shorter versions of it. And then eventually all of the, the short shorts that they had and all of the outtakes and all of the, the, the footage they had were eventually sent to the head office in London. That's where the, the HBC head office was. And that's kind of where it sat in pieces. All the pieces were there. And when the, the Hudson's Bay Company um, set up its Canadian division and began to transfer its archival holdings to Winnipeg, the textual materials came to Winnipeg first, so all of the records of the filmmaking process were brought to Winnipeg. But the film materials remained in London because they were being held by the BFI. And part of that was because they were nitrate materials, mm-hmm. so very dangerous materials. And so when when the first batch of materials came in the early 70s to Winnipeg, the film had stayed in London. So there was records of it here in Winnipeg. Mm-hmm. Um and in the um, the early part of the decade, like 2012, is when the nitrate reels were returned to Winnipeg. And this is at the time when I was I had traveled to London to look at the footage, and I was talking to the archives and saying, I would love to do something with this material. So the Hudson's Bay Company archives in Winnipeg, um, Maureen Dominic was the person, the contact at the archives. So she made the formal request saying, can we get the materials back? Can we have them you know, repatriated back to the archives in Canada where the rest of the Hudson's Bay Company materials were being held? So once that, was, that process was initiated, the Hudson's Bay Company archives of Winnipeg managed to raise the money to, um, to do a, a proper transfer, a 2K transfer of all of that nitrate material and uh, once it was brought back to Winnipeg, I was, as an independent filmmaker, I was the first person in line to say, can I use that footage? They said yes. And then I began uh, with consultation with Peter Geller, the, uh, the person who had written the book that I talked about. Mm-hmm. We began that process of reconstructing, based on the records that we could find, the, the, the 1920 film, The Romance of the Far Fur Country. So looking at this film from 100 years ago, kind of the first feature-length documentary, did you see a lot of things from this film that you see even today, 100 years later, in documentary films and that made now? Yeah, so what was interesting about this, the film is um, the, the film language was still evolving at that point. And so the way they constructed their, their two-hour film was... Um, constructing it really episodically so there's a number of of parts that feel like self-contained shorts and there's a it's a journey story um so there's the 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 filmmakers are traveling to hudson's bay sites across the country and they're they're visiting different places along the way so on the one hand it's like a road movie um uh, except traveling by ship and dog sled and Mm -hmm. canoe and, and so forth um so that that common uh, motif is there, but at the same time, we still have that the the um, 
the expectation that everything up to then had mostly been short films. Audiences were used to shorts. So there is some little breakaway moments where it feels like there's a, this seems like a short that is in, in the broader film that, that lives inside this longer film. And there are some moments that are clearly reenactments where they're, they're little scripted little moments that um, replicate what the filmmakers wanted to communicate in the context of a story where they're memories of life in, on the, on the trap line or, and then other times it's a, it's kind of a tutorial on how to lay a trap and how to trap beaver and so forth. So these are some of the things that are, are being constructed um, for the, the longer two hour film. What was it like to kind of work on this film that, you know, very few people have probably seen over the past 100 years? Yeah, I, I mean, a, a, a pleasure, a, a, an honor in many ways to, to see this material. Um, the first, I, I have a very vivid memory of being in London, going to the archives and, um, you know, having had applied ahead of time and, and said, we want, my brother Chris and I went and we, we wanted to look at the film. So we had made our request and we got these safety prints um, and we put them on the steam deck machine. So we're watching, you know, 16 millimeter safety prints of this footage. And we're watching this, this really amazing footage in black and white um, of some the the cameraman who's you know cranking away on his his silent film camera it's just really interesting and fascinating and then also seeing some of the indigenous people um a chief from fort chippewan who is you know communicating his frustration with the canadian government over restrictions on trapping for his people you know really really dramatic Mm -hmm. um really really um clearly uh, important footage that just needs to get outside of the archives and get get to viewers and then so we watched initially the black and white footage and then when we finally got to see the nitrate the 35 millimeter process being the transfer we could see the actual nitrate in its its um it's quite fragile form but still be able to see the vivid tinting process that the the Hudson's Bay Company had used, which was typical at that time. And so suddenly what had previously we just saw as black and white, we see the the vibrant color that we they were able to 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 get with the 2K transfer. So suddenly it's color. Not not in the color sense that we watch on, on TV and movies now, mm-hmm. but the tinting was just so vibrant compared to the black and white. So those are some of the, the things that stood out to me. Where can people get the film? Because I, I guess you, you do sell it through DVD now? Yeah. So the, the uh, Winnipeg Film Group is my distributor, and that um, is a local um, artist-run co-op here in Winnipeg. And they've got a website where you can order the two-hour film. And I also have my, my feature documentary, where um, we we travel to the same locations where the the romance crew traveled in 1919, we returned to the same communities and we went to see what's still there. Do people recognize anyone in the footage? And so both of those films are available through the Winnipeg Film Group. And the website is winnipegfilmgroup.com or you could very easily just search the Romance of the Far Fur Country DVD and you'll very quickly find a link to where to order the film. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kevin, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can email me at craig at CanadaX.com, and you can go to my website and find hundreds of articles on Canada's history at CanadaX.com. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.